For ages, mathematicians have hoped for a nice, efficient formula for calculating prime numbers, but none have been found. Prime numbers, if you don't recall, are numbers whose only factors are one and themselves. So for example, 6 is not a prime number. It can be factored as 2 times 3, whereas 3 itself is a prime number. It's only factors are one and itself. Many prime numbers are known, but in general they are not particularly easy to find. At the time of recording, it was quite recent in fact that a new, largest prime number was discovered, but it has been years since the previous record. That new largest prime happened to have the form 2 to the power of n minus 1, one less than a power of 2. Prime numbers like this are called Mersenne primes. Of course, for large values of n, this expression gives very, very large numbers, and so it's not easy or quick to figure out if those things are prime. One simple type of function everybody's well acquainted with is what are called polynomials, and boy would it be nice if we had a polynomial that generated prime numbers. Unfortunately, as we'll prove today, there can never be such a polynomial. One more diversion before we talk about polynomials. This is a class of prime numbers quite similar in several ways to the Mersenne primes. They're called Fermat primes. These are named after legendary French mathematician Pierre de Fermat, of course, who's most famous for Fermat's last theorem. Fermat primes are primes of this form, 2 to the power of 2 to the power of n plus 1. Of course, this expression gets large even faster than the Mersenne numbers do, but the first handful of values are easy to calculate and do in fact turn out to be prime. The very first one, with n equal to 0, is 2 to the power of 2 to the power of 0 plus 1. 2 to the 0 is 1, 2 to the 1 is 2, plus 1 is 3, a prime number. The next one, where n is equal to 1, would be 2 to the power of 2 to the 1, that's 2 to the power of 2, which is 4, plus 1, which is 5, which is prime. These Fermat numbers actually turn out to be prime all the way up to f4, which is starting to get pretty big. 2 to the power of 2 to the power of 4 plus 1, this is also prime, it's equal to 65,500. 37. Fermat thought these would all be prime, and wouldn't that be nice, but it turns out the very next number, f5, is in fact not prime. Interestingly enough, no other Fermat number has been found since that was prime, so it's possible, though not yet proven, that f0 through f4 are all prime numbers of this form. After seeing Mersenne primes and Fermat primes both dealing with these powers of 2, you may be surprised that we can do much better than at least the Fermat primes with a simple polynomial. While only the first five Fermat numbers turned out to be prime, this polynomial, f of x equals x squared minus x plus 41, is actually prime for the first 40 values of x, where let's say x is a positive integer. For example, if we plug in x equals 1, we get 1 squared minus 1 plus 41, and that's equal to 41, which is indeed a prime number. If we plug in x equals 2, we get 2 squared minus 2 plus 41. That's 4 minus 2, which is 2, plus 41, which is 43, which is also prime. And yes, surprisingly, these numbers continue to be prime all the way up through x equals 40. If we plug 40 into this function, we get 40 squared minus 40 plus 41, and this turns out to equal 1601, which is again prime. Now it's quite easy to see that the very next number when x is equal to 41 is in fact not going to be prime. We don't even need to do the computation. Just look at it. 41 squared minus 41 plus 41. Obviously everything here is a multiple of 41. And so whatever this number is, it's certainly a multiple of 41, hence not prime. 
And of course, it's easy to see that the number happens to be 41 squared, which is 1,681. Now, if you think that's neat, in terms of a polynomial producing primes for a while, we can actually do even better quite easily. Check this out. If we say f of x is equal to x squared minus 79 x plus 1601, this is actually going to give us prime numbers for the first 80 values of x. So it's from x equals 0 to x equals 79. This will continue to produce prime numbers, although it's not quite as impressive as it sounds. There's a lot of repetition. Of course, it is a polynomial, and since the leading coefficient is positive, it's upwards facing. So the graph of this polynomial very roughly looks like this. So it's not like it's outputting 80 distinct prime numbers, but it is totally prime from x equals 0 to x equals 79. And in fact, it's even less impressive when you realize that this is actually just this polynomial, but shifted up and to the right. But it is still pretty neat, and you can verify that if we plug in x equals 80 to this function, we are actually going to get 1681, which, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, is actually 41 squared, so of course not a prime number. So both of these polynomials are, hey, pretty good tries at trying to make a prime generating polynomial. But like I said, it's impossible to do this. You can't make a polynomial that is prime for every value of x. So let's go ahead and prove that fact. To prove this is impossible, we will of course need to take an arbitrary polynomial. And for that, it's necessary that we know what the definition of a polynomial is. And for our purposes, a polynomial is a sum of terms, each consisting of a non-negative integer power of x with a real number coefficient. You can see our real number coefficients are a0, a1, a2, all the way up through a n. The highest power of x in our polynomial is x to the power of n, so we would say this polynomial has degree n. And the smallest power of x is x to the power of 0, which we actually don't see written because x to the power of 0 is just 1, and so doesn't need to be written. To prove that this polynomial can't possibly generate primes for all integer values of x, let's suppose that it does, and show that leads to a contradiction. If this function does produce prime numbers for all integer values of x, then let's just plug an integer in. Let's say we plug an integer b into this function, and thus we would necessarily get some prime number p. Then our strategy will be to look at what happens when we plug b plus some integer multiple of p, let's say mp, into our function. If we can show that this is going to produce a multiple of p, then we'll be able to wrap up our proof in short order. So what happens? If we plug b plus mp into this polynomial, we get a0 plus a1 times the input b plus mp to the first power plus a2 times the input b plus mp to the second power, and so on, all the way up to the final term, which would be a n times b plus mp to the nth power. Now, to expand all of these terms would take a lot of work, but we only have to do a little bit of expanding to see the key to our argument. Let's first just consider the terms that don't have a factor of p. So those are the terms like a0, and then a1 times b, and then a2 times the b, which is getting squared, and so on. Of course, this expression squared is going to have more than just b squared, but b squared is the only part of this that doesn't have a factor of p. Just like with this last term, the only thing that's not going to have a factor of p, if we expand this, is a n times b to the n. So let's just gather all those terms without a factor of p. And that will look like this. a0 plus a1 times b plus a2 times b squared 
and so on, all the way up to a n times b to the n. Sorry for how squished that is. Of course, everything else, if we expanded this, would have a factor of p. So we can write the rest of the expanded expression as just p multiplied by stuff. Everything else would have a factor of p, so we could pull a p out of it and just leave some stuff behind. Now here's the key. All of these things without a factor of p are actually just f of b. Let's say we actually plugged b into this. What would we get? Well, we would get a0 plus a1 times the input of b plus a2 times the input of b squared plus and so on all the way up to the last term, which would be a n times b to the n. So when we plugged in b and got that prime number p, well, that's just equal to this which is exactly what we have down here. So all of this stuff that doesn't have a factor of p is itself actually equal to p. So this is equal to p plus p times whatever that stuff was. And then of course we can factor a p out of both of these terms. And thus we have p multiplied by one plus stuff. Now you might think this concludes the proof. We assumed for contradiction that any time we plug in a non-negative integer value of x into this polynomial, we get a prime number. But we've just shown if we plug in b plus m times p, where b is just some input that leads to a prime and mp is some multiple of that prime, we actually get another multiple of the prime number, which of course would not be prime and thus contradict the assumption that the polynomial only produces prime numbers. But in fact, we haven't quite forced the contradiction yet. What if this stuff happens to equal negative one? Well then one plus negative one is zero, this would then be zero, and zero is not prime. Okay, so that would be fine. But the other weird thing is what if the stuff happened to be zero? then this wouldn't be another multiple of p and thus a composite number. It would actually just be p itself, which is still prime and thus wouldn't be a contradiction. But of course, there was nothing special about m in this argument. There was nothing special about this multiple of p. So this argument would apply for every multiple of p. And of course, there are infinitely many multiples of any prime number. But it's not possible for a polynomial of degree n to take on the same value more than n times. That's essentially a result of the fundamental theorem of algebra. This means that even if for a particular multiple of the prime number p, all of this led to p itself, it couldn't possibly lead to p itself any more than n times, where n is the degree of the polynomial. At some point, this stuff would have to be something other than zero, and so for one of these infinitely many multiples of p, we would start to get things other than p itself, guaranteed. We would get some numbers that are multiples of p and are thus composite. And so that establishes the result. There cannot be a prime generating polynomial. Some of these polynomials can output primes for a while, but they're always going to start spitting out composite numbers eventually. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions and be sure to subscribe for more of the swankiest, math videos on the internet. Leap from my fate, twisting to escape this. Driving on a mop, mop, my wrist if you can break it. Breaking in my past, I'm making it up fast. So slow down, give me the time so I can fake it. Grace a tune of words and just how I say shit. And let me speak my poetry to your face. It's not in the mid if you ain't listening. Not infinite if you ain't really in the